everyone, welcome to my video on AFP. This is from my Getting Ahead in Medicine series. So the idea behind these videos really comes out of my own preparation for core surgical training. And what I realised is it's actually much, much easier to kind of do these things through medical school if you're so able. Mostly because you've got more time to prepare, but also because if you know what you need to collect as you go through, you can be much more opportunistic. And some of the things that you need to collect for these applications, like surgery for instance, it's after 72 points, you get eight points for organising a teaching programme. Now, organising a teaching programme as an F1 is quite difficult because either you've got to get the trust to allow your attendees to attend on paid time, or you've got to get them to come in their own time, which when you're working shifts, people just don't want to do. So what I realised is you can actually do this in med school really, really easily, and that's a huge eight points on your application. So I started off by doing the... Um, so I've been doing this for my mentees over at Medi Mentor. We've done the surgical one, we've done AFP, and they have found this really useful. So this is going to be a video on how to prepare for AFP. Um, it's a much more limited application, a scoring matrix than the surgical one. So there's only a few things for us to go through. Um, I will do a video on the surgical one, and I can do an IMT one if people are uh, desperate for, for that. So what is AFP? If you've not come across AFP before, it's the Academic Foundation Programme. And this is something you might want to consider doing if you're thinking about having research in your career or medical education. I have to say the kind of the saying kind of goes is that if you want a consultant job in a teaching hospital in certain specialities, then research is something you're going to have needed to be involved in at some point in your career. So it is always good to kind of have some sort of research profile. Um, of, you know, why not why not be paid for it as part of your foundation rotations? So you can apply to AFP as well as the foundation programme. So you've really got nothing to lose apart from a little bit of time if it's something you want to do. So the first section we're going to consider is degrees. So here is the scoring matrix. So this is one of the sections that I'm not going to spend much time on because you either have it or you don't. But what's helpful about this degree section is kind of knowing where you fit compared to other people. So if you're sort of down here at the bottom and you've got um, you know, you're getting four or five points, then brilliant. If you are somewhere near the bottom and you are, you know, coming up at one or two points, at least you know early on that that's probably something you might need to um, compensate for in the rest of the application. If you're someone who's diehard, I want to do AFP, then it is better to know kind of where you sit as compared to your peers. So you've got time to kind of do more things that will hopefully overcome that. So this is the next section. So this is the one where we've really got the opportunity to score as many points as possible. And this is publications and presentations. So there are up to 10 points to be grabbed here. Um, most people I'm sure won't have the full 10 points, especially if you are someone who kind of rattles along, finds out about AFP quite late in the game. You're not gonna have the time to kind of rattle through, you know, five five publications or 10 poster presentations but if you start preparing really early then you've got the time to kind of do this as many as you like you know maybe you've got eight or seven or whatever you get if you're a person who's watching this video who is soon to be applying for afp don't worry there hopefully is still time for you to to try and get in what you can conferences run all all over the you know all the time um and especially now we're in COVID, we're in a COVID time, a lot of these conferences are being presented online only. So it can be really easy to kind of send in your abstract and present it via Zoom or online or whatever kind of their, um, how they're managing this conference. So up to 10 points, two points for an original research paper and one point for each oral or poster presentation. Now, presentations must be national or international so you can't just present them anywhere you've got to be thinking about what conference you're going to go to so anything like um royal college of surgeons uh, rcp these will be national conferences um you can't have things like bma or student or trainee led conferences so if you're wanting to present at these and you you know you, you want to for whatever reason fine do it but be aware that they aren't going to count for your afp applications and it's better to know that now than when you're applying in terms of your publications, they must be peer reviewed and you must have a PubMed ID. Now, PubMed IDs can take a fair while to come through, which is another reason why it's good to prepare for AFP early. Because, you know, I've had friends that have had, you know, submitted things and it's taken months and months and months for their PubMed ID to, to be, you know, 
uh, valid and up there. So try and make sure you've got time to fit that in. All sorts of conferences that you can present at. So think about ASSET, um, the Association of Surgeons in Training. You don't have to be a surgeon to present at an ASSET or, you know, if there's whatever conference you want to do, you know, if it's, if you want to, if you desperately want to be um, an anaesthetist and you want to pre present at an anaesthetics conference and that's national, brilliant, because that shows um, commitment to your speciality early on. That's fantastic and it will serve you well later on. But if you have a project that you think kind of has an anaesthetic slant, but you know you want to do pathology or paediatrics, it doesn't matter at this point. A presentation is a presentation is a presentation. And if that conference you know, sits well with the theme of your presentation, then just send it there. And it really, it really doesn't matter. What matters at the moment is that they're on your CV. Later on, when you come to be kind of, the, you know, you're sort of narrowing what you do, that's when we need to start thinking very clearly about the type of presentations that you're doing in terms of speciality. But please don't feel that you can't apply to asset or you know, pre-medicine conference, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, because as a medical student, you sort of belong to all specialities anyway. And most conferences will have med student um, med student rates. So it's cheaper, it's often cheaper for you to present at conferences. Um, I once presented at the International Conference of Quality and Safety in Healthcare. Um, I did that as a doctor and it was really, really expensive. Um, I did get funding for that, which was helpful. Um, but as a med student, it's so much cheaper and easier for you to present at these conferences. So try and get your presentations in there whilst you're a med student, if your medical studies can support that. So the whole of this video has to be viewed in light of the fact that your medical studies have to come first. And this is something I always say to my mentees. So if you're a person who's really struggling at medical school at the moment and you're struggling just to kind of pass each, each module, then try not to worry about this the most important thing is that you graduate with a medical degree and don't worry about anything else but if you feel like you're on top of things and you want to prepare early then you can use these tips okay prices uh this is the one no one likes uh as far as you know most most people go because prices are quite difficult to come across so usually either you kind of have them or you kind of don't so when we talk about prize we're talking about a distinction or a merit that's at what in one of your med school modules so for instance, you might have done an obs and gyne module and you've got a merit or a distinction in that module. It usually means that you have to have, you have, to have scored in the top 70, 80, 90% of your cohort for that module in both the OSCE and the written. Um, you really want to be shooting for um, 80 or 90 because some applications can have different, uh, different requirements. Um, if that's something you have, brilliant, there's up to five points here and then you've got one of them. If you're a person who doesn't have any merits or distinctions, this can be a really, you know, this can be a stressful category because it's difficult to then go and say, okay, well, I'm going to go and score in the top 10% of this obs and gyne module if it's just not your thing. Um, please don't be weighed or bogged down by this. What you can do is if, if you feel like you're, you know, you're thriving at med school and you're really good at one module, say surgery or something, you know, maybe throw everything at that module and you, you know, maybe you walk away with a, distinct, with a distinction or a merit, but never endanger your overall scores, of course. So for the AFP scoring matrix, this has to be an educational or an academic prize. So um, there are essay prizes as well. Essay prizes are in some ways less useful for your time, because if you do a publication or a presentation, chances are it's going to get it's going to get published and it's almost certainly going to get presented uh, depending on where you send it with an essay prize you know you could spend a lot of time and effort creating an essay prize and actually you don't get anything back for it because you don't you're not the, the top one um, and for AFP this has to be a first prize it can't be runner up or second what you can do is when you think about essay prizes think about some of the smaller prizes so if you win an RCS prize, that's fantastic. It's going to be on your CV even when you're a consultant. It will be there forever because it's huge, it's prestigious. But what's what's good to think about is some of the smaller prizes. So sometimes you will have emails from someone at your university, I'm sure you can think of it, who sends out flyers for things like conferences or training days and those kind of things. And sometimes they will send essay prizes around and they can often be really niche essay prizes like um, histopathology, forensic pathology, forensic psychiatry. And but those prizes are not going to have a lot of entrants, not as many as RCS, I'm sure. So sometimes it can be worth focusing on the smaller prizes and work, walking away with the first prize, as it is 
to go for RTS and, and not get anywhere. But that's something for you to weigh up. Um, so it must be an educational academic prize for um, for AFP. Um, it's got to be national level and it's up to five points available. So there are some, there, I'm going to give you a list of names of a couple of prizes that you can think of that you probably haven't come across. So there's Rulu Club, which is uh, vascular. Um, there's the BGS Amory Prize, so that's the British Geriatric Society. Um, there's a Rehab Psychiatry Prize, there's also a Neuroethics Society. Um, Nancy, which is the uh, Neurosurgery Society, they do a prize. Um, there's a Tim Evans one for ICU. We do one at Medic Mentor as well. Um, so there are all these kind of essay prizes that you might not have heard of that are there to be, you know, used. Um, I would say follow as many people on Instagram, not people, but so follow as many organisations on Instagram as you can, like Asset are always linking prizes. All of these organisations like the British Geriatric Society, as long as they've got an Instagram page, you're going to be made aware as soon as a conference goes up or an essay prize goes up. Instagram is a fantastic resource for medicine, really, if, if you're you know, trying to collect publications and prizes and collaborations and all those kind of things. Um, so in terms of prizes, you can get points for scholarships awarded for educational achievements and you can also get points for nationally awarded funding for a research project or any other fun funding grant. So what do you need to do now? That's, I mean, that's it. So we've gone through all of it. There's only those, those few categories. What do you need to do now? And these are the really important takeaway points. You need to go and get yourself a LibreArch file. You're going to keep this file for the rest of your career. At the moment, it can be a, a, a ratty tatty one. Uh, at some point, you're going to want to get a nice one. But what you need to do is go and get yourself a file. And anything, anything that you have done that is outside of medical school, teaching, leadership, publications, prizes, you need to put that in your portfolio. Section it into section publications, prizes, teaching, leadership, quality improvement. Um, and put what you have in there. One thing that catches people all the time is you do something, let's say you did a teaching thing, and then you've done that and you think, oh, that's in the bank, but you haven't got a letter of evidence. Everything that is in this application and in every application going forward requires specific evidence. If you have anything that you don't have evidence for, go back and track down that person and ask them for a letter right now, as soon as you close down this video, because what happens is it gets very difficult three years down the line, two years down the line, to go to someone and go, oh, uh, you know, by the way, do you remember this thing we did three years ago? Can I have a letter? And they'll be like, well, who are you? And you know, I've worked with many medical students since then. Or someone leaves the trust. So anything you do, your time is precious. Medical school is hard. Anything that you do, you get a letter of evidence. Now, it's, this is not so much for AFP, but certainly for um, any of the speciality applications, they have very specifically worded criteria boxes. So for instance, if you're getting a letter of evidence and you know it's for this box, sometimes it's a good idea to ensure that your evidence reflects what it says in the box, as long as that's what you've done. So if you've, for instance, if you've led, designed, um, led and designed an audit um, and had just demonstrated a positive impact, that's what the criteria says for the points. If that's what you've done, make sure that your evidence says that, because when the examiner comes to market, there's no quibble. If you've led, designed, uh, done all of that, uh, but your evidence just says, you know, uh, Lauren Jane participated in an audit on the 14th of September. That's not evidence. That doesn't demonstrate that I've done what the criteria wants me to do. So go away and make sure that everything you've done, even if it's not relevant to AFP right now, anything that you've anything that you've invested your energy in, try and get a letter of evidence from, because you will need. You, you don't know if you might not need. You might need it later on, and that's really really important. And then what you need to do is you're going to strategize how you're going to collect your points. So go back through the video or go and find the um, scoring matrix. So the A, I should say the AFP scoring matrix are slightly different for different deaneries. So think about where you might want to apply. Have a look at the have a look at the scoring matrix. Add up your points. Look at where you are weak. And then depending on how much time you've got, focus on what you could be doing to help you in, improve your, your scoring criteria. Obviously, the scoring matrix is not definitive for getting onto AFP. All right, space answers, there's the interview, you've got to do critical appraisal. But these are the things that you can do, you know, you could do them from first year, second year, whenever you want to do them, or, you know, even the start of fourth year, whatever you want to do. Um, think about 
think about how your ex your application sits right now and how you're going to improve it and then just look for what's coming along so you know if, if your application is really low on publications then you know go and grab a friend and you know see if or a registrar or someone see if you can organize something if it's presentations presentations are super easy to get go and do an audit um, and you can present it so um, I will just add very briefly because a lot of the a lot of my students that I've done this with haven't been really clear on what an audit is so an audit is effectively where you count something so you will need to do this with a supervisor um, so a registrar or a consultant or someone like that but basically you're going to count some things it can be anything really simple in the hospital for instance you know um, I once introduced a cumulative blood results sheet so I counted how much time it took for so many people to open the medical notes and have a look in and find the correct blood results and then transcribe them and then what I did is I introduced a cumulative blood results sheet at the front of the notes because the cows are never working and then I retimed how much quicker that was obviously it's quicker um, and then I present I didn't present that because it's a very simple audit but I presented something related to that in terms of compliance and how well it was taken up and things like that so that was an audit I introduced a quality improvement which was the um, cumulative results sheet and then I re-audited the whole process to see if my quality improvement had made a difference so that is doing a what we call a closed loop audit so first audit is the first time you measure something introduce something to improve it re-audit to check your um, QI your QI has made a difference and then you can stand back and say you know it's basically saying the NHS can benefit because I have an evidence base to show that this thing has improved so another one that I did for an example is in when I did child psychiatry uh, we were supposed to do mental state examinations in certain meetings for all of the patients. So what I did was I went and looked in the notes over a certain period of time and checked how many people had actually got mental state examinations. Uh, it wasn't optimal. Therefore, I got a laptop for the junior doctor who would be in that meeting and introduced a kind of performer. And then so that's the quality improvement. And then I reaudited. So basically did exactly the same that I did the first time. Um, and then to see if my quality improvement had made any kind of difference, which it had. That you then go and present. So the second one, you could go and present at a psychiatry conference or you could present it somewhere like the International uh, Conference, uh, the International Forum of Quality and Safety in Healthcare, because they're interested in quality improvement. So it's just thinking, you know, where I've done this project because I'm on a psychiatry rotation. Um, I'm not interested in psychiatry, I don't want to do psychiatry, but actually I could go to a psychiatry conference, I could go to a, a quality improvement conference anywhere just think about anywhere that it fits um, and the last thing to note the last thing to note is that if you're doing a special study module if you're doing an elective or anything like that don't let those opportunities go to waste without publishing something or um, presenting something because that's a wonderful opportunity for you to collect some points so if you're about to go on elective doesn't matter where it is before you go, have a think, think, have a chat with your email, your supervisor and say, I could do with doing a, a presentation or a publication. Is there anything that you'd suggest? Would you be willing to supervise it for me? Because you will be needing supervisors at this point. And then if you are doing a QI, you get points for that in the surgical application and the IMT one, I think. So make sure you get a letter for that. I had led, designed um, and then delivered a quality improvement, which has a positive effect. Just make sure you're doing all of those things and then keep it in your portfolio. Um, so that is, this is the end of my summary of the fees for matrix. I hope that's helpful for you. Um, if you are interested in one for surgery or IMT, please comment below and let me know. And I will make this, I'm, I'm waiting until I get my own CST scores back before I, I release the, the CST one, just because I want to make sure that everything I, that, I, everything that I'm telling you is, is valid in terms of what I have done, because it's nice to give you some examples. Um, so that's everything. So I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much.